Hello and welcome to Responses and Error Handling, a part of the Building APIs with ASP.NET Core course. In this module, we'll walk through the types of responses your API should be sending and how to handle when errors happen. My name is Kevin Griffin. I'm an independent software consultant and 10-time Microsoft MVP focused in ASP.NET development and deploying solutions to Microsoft Azure. It is my pleasure to teach you how to build APIs with ASP.NET Core. In this module, we're going to talk about responses. Specifically, we'll cover the types of responses that ASP.NET Core controller actions can send. And then we'll discuss content negotiation and how clients can control how data is returned to them. And finally, we'll cover error handling and how good APIs should report errors. In this section, we're going to cover the three types of results that ASP.NET Core Core supports and why each one deserves special consideration. We've seen iAction result based actions used quite extensively in this course. But what exactly does that mean? I action result is the base for multiple types of responses that ASP.NET Core can return. In the example on the screen, we're returning an OK, but in reality, that's returning an OK result, which is a type of I action result. There are several types of I action results you can return, so let's discuss some of the common ones. Created at action is a common return type for post requests where your action is creating a new entity. The proper response for created entities is a 201 created. But along with that, you're also supposed to supply a location that directs to an endpoint directly for the entity you've created. In the example on the screen, our create product action called create at action and passed into metadata. And first we get a reference to the action, which would be called for getting a product by its ID. The second parameter provides that ID, specifically an ID to the product we just created. And lastly, we pass in a reference to the product that we created. The last parameter is also a part of returning the 201 created. You should supply an updated reference to the product or entity that was just created by your API because the client will most likely want to update their references with the information you provide. Sometimes there are cases in your APIs where you want to return a result that isn't JSON or XML. For example, maybe you want an endpoint that renders HTML or returns an Excel file. The content action takes content you have, and as long as you provide a proper media type, it will send the response you ask. The not found action is used to return a 404 not found or everyone's favorite status code. When a client makes a request, sometimes it'll pass in extra data along with that request. Post requests are a great example. If you make a post request, you need to set along all the data for the post request to work with. A new product needs the information about a new product. If you don't have the information necessary to complete the request, a proper response is a 400 bad request. Lucky for us, there's a helper designed to return this status code. Even better, if you're using ASP.NET Core validation, you can submit the validation results with the bad request and it'll tell the client what the problem is. And sometimes you have a status code that's a little off the beaten path and not covered by one of the included helpers. So what do you do? The status code helper lets you fill in the blank with a particular status code that you like to use. And up to this point, we've been focusing strictly on the result types that implement I action result. But ASP.NET Core can also just return the object that your response is expecting. If you're returning a list of products, your return type can just be list of product. No OK, no bad request. The 200 OK is inferred by using this method. 
And here's another example, but it leads us to another problem. Get product by ID could return a product. But what happens if the product is null or not found? Returning null would still return a 200 OK, which isn't the proper response. So what should we do? What if you could combine the best of both return types? Action result of T allows you to either return an I action result type or an actual object. And this is helpful in our previous example because we can still return the product, but if it's not found, we can just return not found. Most of the examples we've used in this course use a synchronous approach to building controller actions, but it's more likely in the real world, your method calls to services and data source will be asynchronous. And no fear, any controller action can be decorated with async task to achieve the exact same results. In this demo, we'll walk through several result types you can use in your actions. If you've done other parts of this course, you have seen this example a million times. We have a controller action that returns an I action result. And what exactly does that mean? Well, I action result is just the generic interface for a dozen or a hundred different types of actions that you can possibly return. And here's the simplest example. I have my get products action that goes, gets back a, an I enumerable or a list of product, and I just return a 200 OK. Well, that OK is a special return type. It's actually an OK object result. But an OK object result is a type of I action result. And because my return type on get products is I action results, this all magically works. It also sets me up for a couple different scenarios. Let's go down to get product by ID where I'm getting a product out of the database and I'm returning it a 200 OK. But there's this weird edge case. What if the product that I'm looking for based off of the ID does not exist in the database? Well, the way our product repository is set up, the product is going to come back as null. Well, how do we tell the client that we have a null product? The current way things are set up, if product is null and I return OK with a null, it'll still return a 200 OK. And that's not the proper response. The proper response should be a 404 not found. Well, how do we do that using the I action result? Easy. If the product is equal to null, then we want to return a not found. And not found isn't just a not found, it's a not found result. And because not found result also implements I action result, everything magically works in our pipeline. There are other types of responses that we can use with our controller actions. I don't have to use an I action result. In fact, ASP.NET Core allows you to just determine what the type is that you're going to respond with. So for get products, instead of I action result, I could just return list of product. And I can't say okay anymore. I just return the list of products. The response code for this is just a 200 okay. Everything works the way that we expect it to. And I'm going to show you. We'll set a breakpoint on line 22 of our get products. I'm going to run this example. And postman, I've already set up my request. We'll hit send. Our breakpoint hits immediately. We'll step over the products and we'll see there's one product in the list that's going to get returned. And I'm not sending an OK result. I'm just sending products. Back over in postman, we see the result of our call, but there is also a 200 OK. By returning the result of what we want, the 200 OK is inferred. Now, what if we want to refactor our other methods to follow a similar process? 
get product by ID, we don't want to return an I action result. This time we just want to return a product. Well, we can remove the okay and that works, but now we have a new problem. What do we do about this not found? Because there's still this use case of <laughs> the product isn't in the database. So the, the ID that we requested isn't found. Well, what if I were to just comment that out? Let's ignore that possible use case. I've set up a new request. This should get a known product, product ID of zero. We'll hit our breakpoint. We'll step over. A product was found and a product is returned. There we go, 200 okay, and we got a product. Exactly what we were expecting to happen. Now, I'm gonna change the ID to something that doesn't exist in the database. Let's see what happens. I don't have a product that returns null, but what if I just return that null? Technically, it's a successful call. Let's look at what happened. There's no result, nothing got returned. ASP.NET Core did something kind of weird here. It didn't return just a 200 okay. It returned a 204 no content, which is a special type of success code telling us you made a request, it was good, but there was no content. So the the client would take this and call it a success, but it, it wasn't a success. We wanted to return a 404 not found because this particular ID was not in the database. How do we refactor this code? ASP.NET Core makes this pretty easy for us. Instead of just returning a product, we want to return an action result of type product. And this is a generic. So now I can return either just the product that I found, or if I uncomment my original test case, if the product is null, I can return an I action result of any type. And both these cases are considered good or successful. Let's run this example one more time. I'm back in Postman, we'll hit send on the bad request. Our product is not found, it returns null. We'll hit continue and back over in Postman, we can see we got the proper 404 not found that we were expecting. Uh, and we got a proper error code from ASP.NET Core. These are the different ways that you as a developer can set up your actions to send back the response types that you need the client to expect. You can either use an I action result, you can send back the item type specifically, or you can use action result of a particular type. All these work and use them to your advantage. In this section, we'll discuss content negotiation within ASP.NET Core, and you can let clients determine the format which data will be returned. As an industry, we have gone through our fair share of standards. It used to be XML all the things, but as the web matured, we have pretty much settled on JSON as the best mechanism to communicate content through web requests. However, there are still folks out there that still want to talk XML instead of JSON, and that's fine. We can configure ASP.NET Core to talk either JSON or XML. And even better, you don't need to write any code to support it. Now, by default, XML isn't enabled for ASP.NET Core applications, but there's a quick fix. In your configure services method inside of Startup CS, Add a method call to add XML serializer formatters to the end of your add controllers method. This will ensure ASP.NET Core has the proper injections necessary to read and write XML. ASP.NET Core includes some nifty pre-processing tools for you for when new requests come in. If you have XML serialization enabled, like on the previous slide, then all your clients have to do is request XML content by using the accept header in their requests. There is zero code for you to write to support this. ASP.NET Core takes care of it automatically.
Another process for defining what type of format should be used is the format filter attribute on a controller. When this attribute is applied, users can dictate the format they want by appending .xml or .json to a route. Here's an example of the same request, but one is returning XML and the other is returning JSON. In this demo, we'll walk through the process of enabling XML support for our applications and how clients can request data in different formats. For this scenario, we're going to assume we already have a working controller, but a request just came down the line that says we can't just support JSON for our request, we need to also support XML. And as tiring as that sounds, it's really pretty simple to do with our framework as it's already set up. Let's go ahead and run the example as is and talk about how we would request XML from our server. In Postman, I already have a request set up to our products API. And if I hit send, it'll receive JSON. However, this is not what we're expecting. One of the things that we can do is in the header for the request, we can go to the accept parameter, which at the moment, it's currently set to star or slash star. This means it will accept whatever it will get back from the server, which by default for us is going to be JSON. We can override this header by unchecking it and creating a new version of it. This one that says, I want application slash XML. If I hit send now, I still get back JSON. And that's because JSON is the only format that our server can understand. How do we tell ASP.NET Core that we want to use XML in addition to JSON? And back over in our application, we'll go into our startup CS file I'm going to scroll down to the configure services method. And we already have add controllers implemented. This means all the injections for ASP.NET Core APIs and MVC are set up and ready to go. I'm going to piggyback off this method and add XML serializer formatters. And this should add the proper injections for ASP.NET Core to understand that I want to make XML based requests. We'll run this application again. We'll go back in the Postman. Now, this was the original request that returned JSON. We're going to leave application slash XML alone and press send. And this time, we get back XML. There are other ways that we can set up XML or JSON requests depending on what the URL looks like. I'm going to go back to my code and I'm going to decorate this product controller a little bit more. And I'm going to add an element in here called format filter. This is a special attribute for controllers that will take the route into mind to determine whether or not it should return JSON or XML. Well, let's scroll down to our get product by ID call. Now I could use the accept header for JSON or XML or whatever the default is. But sometimes our clients might not be using a method that they can use headers for. Could we inject something into the URL that solves the same problem? Well, ideally, what would a request here look like? It would be API slash products slash, let's say one dot JSON or API slash products slash one dot XML. I can append to the route a dot and a format. The question mark, it means that format is optional. I don't have to add it or not to this particular call. Let's run this application again and see what happens inside of Postman. Now I'm going to put just the simple slash zero to get a particular product by its ID. If I hit send, it's going to return JSON. Awesome. Everything's good. But what if I type dot XML to the end of my endpoint? Well, because I have the format filter enabled on this controller and my route is set up to look for the format, 
ASP.NET Core detected that I wanted XML-based content instead of JSON, which is the default, and returns that format. Now I could also type in .json and get back JSON results. Format filtering is a great little feature if you need to support both JSON and XML. In this section, we'll discuss error handling techniques within ASP.NET Core controllers. And this isn't going to be a problem for you too much because your code doesn't have errors. But we need to talk about the possibility of your team members writing inevitably buggy code. Error handling is an important aspect of API design because nothing is more frustrating to a developer than calling a service and it erroring out and not knowing why. Don't forget that we have HTTP status codes already defined to handle most of the situations you'll run into. 400 status codes mean the client sent a bad request. And a 500 status code means the server had an unrecoverable issue. Use the status codes. For example, if you're validating a request and it's not meeting your requirements, return a 400 bad request and tell the user what was incorrect. But most of your issues won't be client caused. Those will be issues outside of your control, like a database error or a file system IO issue. When these happen, your instinct might be to catch the exceptions and try to handle them. But the best advice I could give you is to simply let exceptions fall through unless there's an absolute way that you can recover from it. Now let's talk about what the process of an exception looks like. Generally, if you don't have any exception handling enabled within ASP.NET Core, your responses are going to look like this. 500 internal server error tells the client something went wrong. And that's about it. Hopefully, you have some sort of telemetry tracking inside your application in order to see what really happened. Turns out, there's an RFC for how to send back a proper response within an API. RFC 7807 is titled Problem Details for HTTP APIs. And ASP.NET Core supports this RFC with a little bit of configuration. Inside your startup.cs file, inside the configure method, you can use the app.useExceptionHandler method to dictate what ASP.NET Core should do in the case of unhandled exceptions. This is useful because it retains all the exception state and call stack so you can properly format your responses. The path you give the exception handler is a redirect to another action within your application. And let's look at where the error path takes us. The method problem on a controller is another helper for returning RFC 7807 style responses. Beware though, this response object is gonna look pretty generic. An error occurred while processing your request. You've probably seen that a thousand times. In reality, it's probably as useful as you want to get without divulging critical information. But could you provide more information if you wanted to? Of course. Here's a rewrite of the error action that allows us to extract the stack trace and message from the original unhandled exception. This information can be passed along to the problem helper, which formats the response in a way that makes sense. Note, it's probably a good idea to only do this in development mode since you don't want to give away stack traces or system information in error messages. You can use the same exception handlers to log or report exceptions however you wish. In this demo, we'll explore error scenarios and how you can best handle them within your APIs. We need to discuss the inevitable. Not caused by you, but someone on your team is going to write buggy code and exceptions are going to happen. But how do we handle those exceptions in a way that's API friendly? Well, let's imagine we take this code that we've written, we've run a million times, and we go over to Postman and try to execute a call. So I go to API slash products and give it an ID. I'll hit send. Ooh, but something's wrong in my application. Apparently an element is null. 
I get back a 500 internal server error, and that's expected because this isn't anything that I caused as the client. The, the request is perfectly good. Something happened on the server. And as the client making this request, can I take this error message and do something useful with it? It turns out the answer is no. Uh, this response message is kind of useless. It's coming back as plain text. It's also worth noting if you were running this in the browser, you'd get back a slightly different version of this error message. Because I'm running in development mode, this is returning the developer exception page. And that's something that we can easily turn on and off depending on our configuration. That's done in your startup.cs file. For the sake of argument, I'm going to remove this code and we'll assume we're always running in production mode. Let's rerun this original request. Well, this time I get back a 500 internal server error, but there's no text at all. It's just a blank screen. How do I as the client know that something bad happened? The status code should be good enough, but is there a way that I can give more to the client? Well, back over my code, I'm going to go to my configure method and we're going to add another element to the route table. We're going to tell ASP.NET Core that we would like to use an exception handler. And when an exception occurs, it should redirect automatically to a route defined as just slash error. That part doesn't matter at all. It does matter where that endpoint redirects to. I've already taken the liberty of creating a route action that points to slash error. Now notice there's a little bit of fancy C sharp stuff here. I'm creating my action result, and instead of just having a method body, I'm using a Lambda to say, when this route is executed, it should just return a problem. A problem is a fancy I action result. Just in the same way that we return OK, if we return bad request, we return not found. Problem will actually go and pull the context for the exception and return an RFC 7807 formatted error. Let's rerun this application again and see what the results look like. Stop, let's reverse, and let's touch on a very important point. Order matters. We cannot set the exception handler after we've enabled routing. In fact, we need to swap these. And the reason for that is because we need the exception handler to add its hooks into our route management pipeline so it can listen for any potential exceptions that happen down the line. So back in Postman, we'll make our request. And this time we get a 500 internal server error, but we get a piece of JSON. And JSON is something that our API clients can receive and process, and then we can just use in our applications. Now notice it just gives us a generic, an error occurred while processing your request. We can override this information if we want to, and that can be done by going back to our code. We're gonna change our exception handler to custom error. And the reason for that is that I have another endpoint set up called custom error. Inside of custom error, I first go get the context of the error that occurred. The way the exception handler works, it does a redirect to this particular route. So all the exception information is available. We just have to go get it. And that comes back as context. I can then again call problem. Remember, this is an I action result. And I can override any part of that response that I want to. The title, the details, the status code. I'm going to override the title and set that to whatever the exception message was. This should hopefully give our client a little bit more information so it can give a good error message to our user. We'll rerun this application. I'll hit send one more time. And we see we still get a 500 internal server error. We get back a JSON response. 
but this time the title is the exception message that I've received. So there you go. That is basic error handling in ASP.NET Core. Use this tool to your advantage and good luck. In this module, we dove deep into ASP.NET Core action responses. We learned about the three types of responses that ASP.NET Core can support, depending on what you're returning and how you want to return it. Do you have clients that sometimes use XML or sometimes use JSON? Content negotiation allows your clients to decide the formats they prefer. And lastly, good APIs return good errors. We learned about proper formatting for errors when something goes wrong within your applications. Thanks for listening to the responses in error handling module, part of building APIs with ASP.NET Core course. My name is Kevin Griffin.